Before I show you some photographs, let me tell you what happened while I was walking down Pennsylvania Avenue today. I came opposite a store which had just caught fire. Everybody ran for whatever was needed to put that fire out. A fire engines came with a crash and everybody helped. And in a few minutes, it was out. That's the way, friends, we go about fighting fires. But suppose a whole city of people is going straight to perdition. We often stand by such spectacles and say, well, it's none of my business. And if some man whose heart has been stirred by what he has seen cries, come, Help save our brethren, men say, ah, oh, that man is a crank. He's forever poking his nose into other people's business. Now, you ask me, what's all this got to do with how the other half lives? Everything. Friends, let me set before you some facts, some facts by which we can show that parts of New York City are indeed like the fires of hell. In New York today, which a hundred years ago did not have a single tenement, three-fourths of the people live in tenements, 37,000 tenements, and more than a million, 200,000 people call them home. Just look at this, will you? Houses set endways and edgeways and every which way so that rents may be wrung out of the poor tenants. No sunlight, no air, no grass for the children to romp. People compelled to live as no human beings ought to live anywhere. Those Tenements every year throw off a scum of forty to 50,000 human wrecks to the prisons, the lunatic asylums, the poor houses, the paupers' hospitals, the orphanages. They support a standing army of 10,000 tramps and vagabonds. They've turned out in the last eight years a half million beggars and sent one-tenth of all who died in the city to the unmarked graves of Potter's Field, one in ten. And people say, oh, that man is an enthusiast. He's a crank on that subject. He puts it too strongly. Well, we'll begin at the beginning. If there's one place on this earth that could be called God forsaken, I think I should say it was this one. It's called Blind Man's Alley because the blind beggars of the city herded there for years. They only left when the Board of Health, prompted by the exhibition of this very picture, at last compelled the owner to clear it up. Let me take you upstairs and show you some of the tenants. Now, this is a flash photograph, and with the unpracticed hands I had in such work back then, I set fire to the house, taking it. I put the fire out, though, burned my hands and clothes doing it. When I had it out at last, I went down into the street and tried to get a policeman to help, but instead of sympathizing with me, he laughed at me. <laughs> sure, that, that place burn? Nothing of the kind. It caught fire six times last winter. It cannot burn. The dart's so thick, it smothered the fire. Now, friends, here you have some of the Christian work that you represent. Day by day, the children are brought here and taught, and you'll notice this one thing, that once they're cleaned up and made presentable, they're just as sweet and nice as your children or mine. It's the surroundings that make the difference. Let's take one of the tenements and see what it looks like. Now, when I took this picture, I was bothered to death by the clotheslines in my photo. Those clotheslines annoyed me, but after a while I learned that they were one of the cheerful sights in this desert of misery. They were evidence that someone was trying to keep clean. So I have come to the conclusion that the clothesline is the true line between poverty and utter destitution without hope. But go about at sunset some evening, and you will see an army of men and women slouching along with the unmistakable gait of tramps, those who live by begging. 
You'll be troubled to find what becomes of them till you look sharp and find doorways down into the side alleys. This one is called Bandit's Roost. Let's go down into one of the alleys and see what goes on there at three o'clock in the morning. For two cents, you can get a round of drinks and have the privilege of sleeping all night on the table or under it. Tramps, all of them. On one of my visits, I came upon this tramp. I told him that if he'd sit still for a minute so I could take his picture, I'd give him ten cents. That was probably the first and only ten cents that man earned by honest labor in the course of his entire life. And it was sitting down, at which he was an acknowledged expert. Out of the alleys comes the problem of the children. This one came out to the alley just as she is here on the left. Her hair was matted with blood and her whole body was covered with sores. What will be the future of this child? Can you read it in her face? I can. And after she had been in the care of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, this is the way she looked on the right. In the last 16 years, that society has thrown its arms around between 50 and 60,000 children. What a record of work. And this is the Foundling Asylum, known all over the world as Sister Irene's Asylum. That good sister has gathered many thousands of waifs from the streets of New York into her fold. Catholic or Protestant, no difference. When, when one day... The pearly gates swing wide to let in that dear woman, I tell you. Such a flapping of little wings will be heard come to greet her as has not been heard since the moving stars sang together. Now you have seen the boys and girls, and you have seen their homes. Here is the father of some such so drunk that when we fired the photographic flash, he never woke up. Where do you expect to find him next? In a place like this. It's a bad picture, I know, but it's not nearly so bad as the place. Dock rats, these men, drinking beer under a dock. That's their business by day, drinking beer. At night, they come out and sneak along the waterfront, and there they lie in wait. And should their prey foolishly resist or make an outcry, well, dead men tell no tales. But the criminals don't live long. Their race is rapidly run. Their last station is the morgue, where they have a rough pine box all to themselves. Twice a week, a steamer comes and fetches up a lot to Hart Island. There, they are laid in a trench shoulder to shoulder at Potter's Field, packed as tightly as they were in life, the lost tenth of New York's population. Fifty to a row, a little dirt, then another fifty on top, a little more dirt, then another fifty. Finally, the trench is closed, and their long Sad story with it. Now, if, dear friends, that were really the end, if there were nothing beyond this, what would be the use of my standing here and talking to you? Thank God, there is something beyond Potter's Field, for out of its gloom and misery and desolation, there comes the voice of our Savior with the promise Inasmuch as ye have done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Thank you. Oh,